The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, T. Rowe, Price Australia Limited, ABN 136206689589, AFSL 5037411, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome listeners, as we embark on an exhilarating journey into the world of impact investing. I'm your host, Karen McLeod, and I'm thrilled to guide you through this four-part series where we'll explore the dynamic landscape of finance with a conscience. It's more than just numbers on a spreadsheet. It's about driving change and shaping a future where prosperity knows no bounds. So join me on this exhilarating journey as we explore how finance meets purpose. Investing used to be just about making a meaningful return on your investment. But what if your investment could not only deliver a return on your investment, but also do more good, both environmentally and socially, for the world we all live in? The opportunities now to own quality businesses that have the potential to create a positive impact on society and the planet are broader than they have ever been. T. Rowe Price is a premier global asset management organisation actively investing in opportunities to help people thrive in an evolving world. By understanding clients' needs and delivering timely, actionable insights and solutions, we can help them navigate change and achieve better outcomes. Hey there, I'm Karen McLeod. Welcome to episode two of our podcast, where we're diving into the world of impact investing conversations. We'll be exploring how financial advisors can make these discussions more engaging and insightful when they're speaking with their clients. Australian impact investment market as of the 31st of December 2019 was valued at a whopping $19.9 billion. But experts predict that demand for impact investment products from Australian investors could skyrocket to a staggering $100 billion over the next five years. That's not just growth, that's a meaningful shift in how we approach investing and how we need to speak to our clients. So today, we're fortunate to have not one, but two seasoned financial advisors joining us to shed light on this topic. Let's meet our experts who will bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table. Our first guest is Justin Medcar from F Invest in Sydney. With over 20 years of experience in the financial industry, Justin and Death Invest are trailblazers in impact investing strategies. They've honed their skills, engaging clients in impactful investment conversations, and then aligning their clients' financial goals with social and environmental impact. Welcome, Justin. And joining yeah, Justin, ne- lovely to have you. And joining Justin is Tim Fitzpatrick from Ethical Investment Services, an expert in sustainable finance and impact-driven investment solutions for the past eight years. Tim is based in Brisbane and he has meaningful dialogues with his clients all across the country about their investment preferences and values. Welcome, Tim. Hi, guys. Hi. So together, Justin Medcalf and Tim Fitzpatrick are here to guide us through the art of impact investing and how we can have better conversations with our clients. Welcome. So I thought firstly, we might just delve into the benefits of having impact investment conversations with our clients because... As you both know, these discussions aren't just about dollars and cents. They're about making a positive difference in the world. So, Justin, I thought, firstly, let's start with you. Could you share with us how engaging your clients in conversations about impact investing has really strengthened your relationship with them and deepened you know, their involvement in their own investment planning um, and financial planning journey? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Happy to answer that. Uh, the You've sort of covered some of what I would say are some of the key benefits uh, in in having these conversations with clients in the sense of deepening their involvement. Uh, and I think one of the other things that quite often is discussed when, when we talk to other advisors who have specialized or have had a greater focus on ethical impact investing is that there's this stickiness that comes and, and this alignment. So, you you tend to see that when markets are performing as well as they should, as as we'd like, uh, clients are less worried about the financial return because part of their reason for investing isn't purely financial. They're also mm-hmm. looking at the, the the alignment piece and the ethical 
benefits or the the positive environmental social benefits that investments bring. So they they tend to also because of that alignment that that stickiness also helps in in client retention uh, is another key area that we see or I've seen in my my history. Uh, the other key benefit for me is just the fact that we are, you know, somewhat fellow travelers. So, you know, the part of what brought me into uh, impact and ethical investing is that I had a keen interest in in making a positive difference. And so, so do our clients. And so, there's this real sense that we are on the journey together versus, uh, you know, this is me helping you on your journey. And so I feel that the combination of clients having less of a financial return focus when when markets aren't performing so well uh, is one key benefit. That that deepening of the relationship, uh, as you raised initially, Karen, another key benefit, uh, and, and just the fact that you are on this journey with them uh, in in a more uh, aligned fashion. Mm, such a great point. I love that that sort of kinship that you're on that journey together. And you're unwavering, I suppose, during times of turmoil, financial disruption or changes to legislation or any bumps along the way that you're there to support each other and I mean, obviously make changes to the portfolio and, and how you deliver financially and impactfully for the client, but that you're, you've are you got that solidarity, that your, your main goal is you're unwavering, I suppose, towards that main goal. So that's, yeah, fascinating. I agree with those points completely. And Tim, what about you? Can you elaborate on any positive outcomes or advantages you've noticed in your practice as a result of engaging clients in these sorts of conversations? Yeah, I think pretty much in line with what Justin was saying, where it's it makes for having a lot more interesting clients, so the kind of clients you want to deal with, right? So, you know, obviously you talk through portfolio performance with their reviews or outside of reviews, but it opens up this whole other conversation with people. So, at this um makes for a more interesting dynamic with your clients, I think, mm. the kind of people you want to have discussions with. So I think that's probably one of the big advantages for us in focusing in that uh, the ethical and impact space. So true. Yeah, you're able to discuss with them um, topics that are beyond the financial metrics of their portfolio. You can talk about the, the real-world impact their investments are having in social yeah, or environmental terms, yes, agreed, what which engages them. Money. Yeah. yeah, that's so true. So what about um, some challenges that you might have come across um, in your impact investing conversations? Have you ever had you know, a tricky conversation or something you weren't entirely sure how you were going to respond to? This could be a challenge that some of the advisors uh, listening to this podcast might be thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I'm uh, – equipped, well-equipped enough to sort of answer every question a client might have on this topic. How do you handle these moments, Justin? Like what sort of personal experiences or challenges have you faced um, navigating any tricky discussions with clients? Yeah. It's, I mean, I think I think it's just part and parcel with the, the, the work that we do as financial advisors. At times, you're going to have clients that know more about a particular issue or a topic than we do. And the the idea that we need to be experts across every single social and environmental issue, I think, is is just unrealistic. Um, not to mention the fact that I think by not having the conversation, you are missing out on all those benefits that Tim mentioned earlier. Um, and so I think what tends to happen is advisors that I've spoken to uh, across across the industry that have shown an interest or their clients have ask the question, they, they d- tend to feel like, well, it's easier not to go there than to actually start asking these questions. And obviously, there's ethical, uh, you know, code of ethics concerns around that. But the I think, you know, th- there's nothing wrong with taking things on notice, you know, um, being able to learn from our clients as well. We have a lot of clients that are, you know, professors in, in photovoltaics or, you know, in, in the medical fields and so we tend to learn off them as well as help guide them in their journey. And we tend to sort of, at times, um, build more of a partnership-style relationship as a result. Now, ultimately, they are coming to us for advice and they, you know, that is the role that we play. But I don't think it's, I don't, I don't think you should shy away from some of these 
these these topics or these these you know asking open questions don't always feel like you have to have the answer and there's nothing wrong with saying look i haven't looked into that area um you know some clients will come in with you know really strong convictions around nuclear for instance and you know we tend to listen to the client as you would expect trying to understand where that's coming from ask some open questions and Ultimately, you know, it's not for us to decide what's right for the client in the sense of their ethical or their value concerns, but it is up to us to be upfront around the, the, the financial and the risk metrics that come with that and provide, you know, with research, uh, the, 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 the fuller picture around whether that's a, the right investment for them or not. So, so true. It's great to have the discussion, but then you've got to be able to follow through and, and explain to them if that's going to align with their financial goals, of course, and their risk profile. Yes, completely. So impact investing, that's still the mainstay of obviously what we do. But encouraging advisors, I think, yeah, to continue to have the discussion despite its challenges. What about you, Tim? Have there been any, you know, insights you would share with advisors about how you'd sort of overcome any tricky discussions that could come about in your practice? Well, yeah, no. Speaking with clients, that's always a good source. But it's also looking at um, other resources that you might have when you come across these challenges. Like, um, yeah, there's RIA, obviously. They've got a lot of great resources around impact investing and responsible investing. There's also, you know, outside of licensee groups, there's like the Ethical Advisors Cooperative. So it's if you've got that network where if you do come across a sticky question or something you're not quite sure about, that's where you can, you know, utilize that network i think that's a really uh helpful way to overcome these challenges where yeah you can obviously take a question on board from a client and just be confident in saying well i'm not quite sure about that on there to look look into it further and then knowing where to go and having those resources available i think that's a yeah useful way to overcome these challenges um i think that's true i think advisors listening should be encouraged to accept they they can't know everything as Justin and you've mentioned um, and just to be prepared to do the research because it's such a fast evolving field at impact investing and and things change you know ethical values and technologies change and what people want to invest in socially or environmentally is changing so quickly it's important for advisors to realize what was perhaps suitable five years ago is definitely not what's going to be suitable today. Would you agree? And the range of, range of products available compared to five years ago. So I'd say we, we all get a lot of stuff coming across our desks. And mm. so it's yeah, kind of trying to figure out how best to cut through all of this and then relay it to clients. Really. Yes, that's true. And those resources that you've mentioned that the Responsible Investment Association for Australasia and also the Ethical Advisors Cooperative, I would agree they're great sources of using your peers um, and other constituents in the industry to sort of lean on to gather that knowledge. They've already done lots of reporting um, in this area. That's so true. So what about gathering that client information and, and you know, doing the fact-finding process now? Is there, is there a way, Tim, that you would, you know, encourage advisors to sort of, you know, gather this information from clients about their impacting investing preferences in a way that feels natural and non-intrusive? Any suggestions there? I think the easiest way for that is just to incorporate it into the fact-finding process. So whether it's in your data collection form or whatever, where it's, you know, do you have an interest in impact investing or any experience in that? Um, so that's that kind of initial prompt where it just, it's all part of that conversation from the start. And then obviously once you're working with a client, you know, things change, um, interests will change or, you know, what's available in the market will change. So it's a case of yeah, just effectively making notes and having those props come up each time, whether it's a review or a meeting, so that you know you may not know a client's prefer- preferences or experience off the top of your head, but it's at least readily accessible or it comes up. Um, it's it, I keep saying prompt, but that's just the way I kind of view it, where it's as long as you've got that... Um, uh, that note that comes up that can kind of feed into further discussions with the, with the client, I think that helps it feel a bit more natural um, mm. work. That's true. Do you find also that um, 
you know, if you might have a client that's a bit shy, but sometimes it's, I find it's easy to sometimes ask them what they're working on in the office, perhaps, or like what they're yeah. in their vocation, because often then you'll get a real sense of sort of where their passions are or their hobbies, you know, really finding out about them as a person. And then you can lean on asking deeper questions about how that might relate to their investments. Yeah. Is that how? Yep. No, that totally. So whether it's work or, yeah, like you said, hobbies outside of work. So they might mm. be more. You know, whether they are um, environmentally focused or more socially focused, that kind of helps you get an idea of, right, if certain impact investments do come up, they may be more interested in the social side of things rather than the environmental. So, yeah, it's just having that um, understanding of the client as a whole, I guess. That, um, mm, I love that idea, the client as a whole, exactly, yes. And do you find the same, Justin, how would you – you know, encourage advisors to really understand their clients' preferences about investing with impact? Yeah, Tim raised a few uh, very um, similar uh, tools or or methods that we deploy at at ETH Invest. And I I think the the comment around incorporating to fact find, I think is really crucial. You know, you don't want this to be sort of this this sort of odd or weird um, uh, addition to the process or an extra step. and I think the challenge that quite often comes up, and I know this is a challenge that I've heard from many other advisors as well, and I, and I did mention this in the last response um, around the challenges. Part of the part of the process for for us in particular is if we can understand a client's ethical concerns up front um, in the data collection stage of, of the of the process of the advice process, it allows us some time to look into those issues so it does give you that preparation time for that initial meeting um you know rather than sort of walking in and going oh you know what are some of your ethical concerns and they raise something you don't even know <laughs> it was a concern that any client could have you know it, it gives you that time to do some of that initial research and and the resources that tim mentioned both in the form of the responsible investment association and the ethical advisors co-op including uh the the co-ops uh, you know, their, their support network with advisors mentoring other advisors through this process, I think is really another thing to mention there. Uh, but yeah, so incorporating into your fact find is is key and you know, being able to then have that as be part of the ongoing dialogue around their portfolio. So one of the things that we've done at Eth Invest uh, and you know, given that we've been doing this for over thirty years, we, we've probably got a little bit of an advantage in the sense that you know this is predominantly what we do. Uh, is that we've worked with one of our independent platform providers uh, to actually incorporate uh, not only asset allocation pie charts into the review documentation, but also an impact spectrum. So we have, uh, you know, a, a conversation around performance, around you know any changes in their circumstances, etc. Uh, but also when we get into asset allocation and, and what's happened as a result of certain asset classes performing better than others. We also then look at what's changed from an impact spectrum perspective. So it's almost a similar conversation where we go, you know, as a result of these these movements or these uh, different holdings within particular particular funds, you know, this particular fund has moved into um, a different rating. So we actually use a, a traffic light system at Invest, uh, one that has been... Um, we've been using now for at least the last 15 or so years and it, and it does come from uh, some of the, the the thoughtful work from the impact management project so a, a worthwhile resource to look at for anyone interested in being able to try and simplify some of these conversations into categorization so we actually have all of our managed funds and our listed equities uh, reviewed by our sister company, which, which is Australian Impact Investments. So Australian Impact Investments, they do some, a lot of the research for us, which helps. But we, because we're able to put it into a traffic light system where we have red as harm, so investments that, directly, uh, that are directly involved in activity that harm or may harm people or planet, then we have an avoid harm category, which is our amber, uh, which is investments that have no direct involvement. Uh, in activities that harm people or planet. And then we have the green, which is investments that not only act to avoid harm, but are also involved directly in activities that benefit people and planet. So that's our standard uh, traffic light system. We've actually got two other 
categories on top of that, which is where you find most of your impact investments. Now, some of depending on where you go, some of the ones that we categorize as, as, as green would be also considered impact investments like Pangana Web or Northstar. But the, the blue is our final or our, it's not our final, but it is, it is a, a key categorization that we have, which is contribute to solutions where there's uh, an intentionality and an, an additionality. So where that capital is, is um, providing, or well, it's, it's new capital that's being provided to those particular activities. Uh, and then also the final part, which is important for us, is is its measurable outcomes. And so that tends to be, by definition, what how we define impact is, is those three things: additionality, um, uh, measurability, and and uh, and additionality. Did I say additionality twice? I mean, yeah, <laughs> intentionality. It is important. Yeah, yeah. It is important. Yeah. So I like the crowd less. Yeah. So that's a good approach. Yeah, well, it's sort of back to those challenges. You know, if if a client puts a whole list of things that they want to avoid and things they want to invest in, if you take the sort of pure negative and positive screened approach to start with, um, which I think is the, probably we've found is the best way to discuss this. You know, if you say to a client, "Do you want, you know, inv- you know ESG or risk mitigation? Do you want?" Uh, particular type of responsible investment or do you want impact, they're not going to know the difference between the three or most clients aren't going to know the difference. And so by talking about issues, both negative and positive, that they want to either avoid or actively invest in, that's a great starting point. And then for what the challenge that we have and that we've worked through is being able to then move them into, move the client through into this traffic light conversation where we have, well, how much harm are you willing to have in your portfolio? You know, uh, uh, um, transition metals are the important part of, uh, you know, the, the decarbonization story. Yes, no. Um, so maybe they do have some red um, stocks in there, which historically they probably didn't. Um, and so, yeah, getting back to sort of this review process, we have this as this pie chart where you can clearly see, you know, what proportion is red, what proportion is amber, what proportion is green, what proportion is blue. And that allows us to have a, a very visual representation of the client's portfolio. And then from there, we can discuss more on the basis of those colors or that traffic light and categorization versus specific issues. And I think that comes back to what we were talking about earlier with you know, one of the advantages of focusing on this as a business, where it's just that added engagement for a client. Like they can see what impact their portfolio as a whole has. Mm. So, you know saying that they're supporting certain sectors or avoiding certain harm. It, yeah, it's just it goes past your portfolio returned X percent in the last 12 months. They want to know what else it's done. So, And how do you find, Justin, the conversations out of using that that in, impact spectrum? Does that often encourage clients to, you know, improve their portfolio, for want of a better term, over the years and to put more into the impactful investments and less – or does it? Is it just sort of um, a moving feast by you directing the traffic? If that makes sense. <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a horses for courses because you know, uh, using the example of you know critical minerals as uh, as one particular, you know, what we tend to find is that a lot of the companies that are involved in in a lot of those uh, critical minerals are still categorised as red. And, and we're finding that slowly some of them are starting to move into the amber category. So um, IGO is an example of one of those companies that's now recently moved into uh, amber category. And so we are, you know, and, and through engagement with a lot of those companies, whether that be super funds doing the engagement or groups like the Ethical Advisors Co-op uh, working together or the Australian uh, Centre for Corporate Responsibility, ACCR or Market Forces, you know, there's a lot of, different actors in this space um, agitating for change uh, in using multiple levers. Um, and we are seeing more and more companies transitioning from maybe a red to an amber or an amber to a green. We, we tend to see less going the opposite direction. So what we t- going back to your question, Karen, around clients and, and, and that conversation and, and around their spectrum, we're often seeing clients asking, you know, why is there some red in my in my in my portfolio, um, or how do I get more blue, especially when we talk about the spectrum. And you know, when we do have the conversation, usually they are happy to stay, You know, especially if we're clear on why there's some red in their portfolio. 
as long as that's aligned with the initial values that they've shared and that they you know and there's been no significant shift what we're finding more often is clients who perhaps were negative against certain mining industries are now positive i would agree with that i think also some of the mining is um, moving into more recycling of minerals and and rare yeah so there's a they're shifting their own processes which is helping our, our stock selection so yeah that's really interesting just to see where um how clients react to that visual pie chart is is interesting and how they do want to continually improve is, I think, human nature and then how we work as their advisor to to balance their, um, you know, their aspirations and goals for impact and also the the financial risks involved in moving them across. Yeah. What, do you have any comments there, Tim? Uh, I think the key piece is, yeah, just having that communication with the mm. clients. So it's whether it's the the visual aid or, you know, your own research or research from a, an external provider. So, you know, particularly with managed funds, I think, as well, where, you know, you might be putting a client in a, you know, uh, they have, might have several managed funds in their portfolio from an impact perspective as well. Um, but, you know, there may be some individual holdings within there, whether it's a retailer or a miner or whatever. And you're giving that client the research saying, look, this fund's been recommended because of who it meets your criteria overall. Um, but just so you're aware, there may have been these companies in here, what, you know, whether that's nudging it to the red or just um, whatever your terminology might be. But the, the main thing is just providing the client with the relevant informa- information, cutting through everything out there, distilling it down for them. And then you can have that conversation with them as to you know, whether they continue with it or you know, mainly your reasonings behind recommending it as well, I think. I think that's an important point to really clarify with advisors listening, isn't it, is that investors in this space um, appreciate and expect transparency uh, and disclosure. So, and they don't expect perfection. Would you agree that that's sort of, so it's important as, you're, as the advisor for the clients to be upfront, as you said, about any holdings that might be in conflict with their um, expectations, um, and then might, yeah, um, expect perfection from the onset. Yeah, that's so true, and that's important to know. Yeah. yeah, it's important to know who those clients are, and obviously yeah. where they draw the line in the sand. And I exactly, think that's yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's really important uh, as an advisor to respect that. And as Justin said earlier, it's not our decision to. to to make a judgment on what's appropriate or, or not for a client in terms of what they believe is impactful. It's about listening and then finding the best solution for them, really. Um, yeah. So, which um, at the moment is becoming easier because there's um, an increasing number of products and investment opportunities in the impact investment space, which we'll cover in future podcasts. Um but just encouraging the advisors to really unpack with their clients what is suitable for them. Would there be anything else that you would say, um, Tim, that, you know, there's any, are there any misconceptions that you see or any, any difficulties in navigating terminology in this space where clients are confused about what they want? Do they come in and ask for ethical or ESG or impact? Are there any things that you want to share there that you should I love it. See, I don't think we have clients. I think it's more advisors and the product providers are the ones that get hung up on the terminology. The clients come to us because they just want their portfolio to do good, right? And so it's, you know, whether it's within that whole responsible investment spectrum, I don't think for the most part, okay, whether it's a purely impact investment or an ESG fund or an ethical fund, um, just as long as their portfolio is doing what they want it to do. And as long as they're confident and comfortable that we're monitoring it, and it comes back to all of that information, you know, all of the stuff that comes across our desks that I was talking about earlier, like we don't have to give the clients all of that information. They don't want to be bombarded with everything with all the calculators out there. They just want to know that we're across it and we're making recommendations and explaining our reasons behind it. So yeah, the, the terminology piece, that's always a it's a fun conversation with clients, but I can often see their eyes just glaze it over when I'll start talking about well, yeah, the differences between ethical ESG and impact. Mm, agree. Um, so back to RIA, I think the easiest visual tool for that is RIA's mm. responsible investment spectrum. So. Mm. I would definitely agree. So for advisors listening, there is a 
how would we find that? It's in a maybe we can get Ensemble to share it, but it's basically a spectrum that shows the different def- definitions for all of the um, the t- types of ethical investment that's covered in podcast one, obviously, of this series. Um, but that's often helpful for advisors just to wrap their own heads around what the different definitions mean, but not to be too hung up on it, but more so focus on what you listening to your client is your message by the sounds, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. If you just Google um, uh, RIA, R-I-A-A, a responsible investment spectrum, there's another term for the group, um, then you that'll come up straight away as well. Thank you, Justin. Excellent. Good suggestion. So you guys have had some incredible insights. Is there any... Um, is there any particular example that you'd like to give from, you know, conversations or case studies, you know, client conversations that you've had where you've been able to deliver a meaningful impact solution for a client? You want to give, just before we wrap up, um, an example to the listeners? I'm happy to jump in, Tim. Uh, I've got a couple. I'll touch on I'll touch, touch on both of them really quickly. Um, and I think one of the things that we haven't discussed yet, which is uh, the the how we are able to engage with both retail and wholesale clients. So conscious that some of the listeners may not be able to work with wholesale clients or may not be able to work with retail clients. So I thought it would be worthwhile just sharing a story on both ends. Um, retail, a couple, you know, there's been a couple of comments made already, I think by yourself, Karen, and also Tim around the, the just the, the vast options that are now available in both impact and across the different definitions around responsible investing. And so it, it's fantastic as an, as an advisor, there's so many solutions available for retail investors. One of the challenges, dependent on how how pure you want to go, is that a lot of what the industry or the impact investment industry talk about impact is, is tends to, to lean towards more private markets. Um, so whether that be VC funds or private equity funds or real assets, infrastructure funds, et cetera. And so you, you have this challenge of where, you know, there is still definitely a, a selection of funds that are available to retail investors, but the, you know, where you probably find the more sexier uh, investments or the more impactful investments, well, uh, is, 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 you know, still predominantly within the wholesale investor offering. So getting back to um, examples, we tend to not talk too much to retail clients about all the wholesale solutions available because we don't want them to have this sense of you know, fear of missing out or, or you know, um, we we don't want to sort of, um, we, we want to provide them a solution and, and there are solutions available, which is great. But getting back to uh, specific examples, we, we have... I'm a vegan myself, and so a few vegans have, have worked that out and uh, have have shared. And so um, we get a few referrals of, of vegan clients come through these days. And uh, one of one of the clients who recently came in and found out I was a vegan wanted to give me a hug. Um, and but the what I did with her, which I thought was really um, useful, is try to understand where some of her beliefs came from and where where her uh, animal welfare related concerns you know what 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 in her life and getting her to share her story uh, I found it was a really helpful way of connecting with her and understanding how important um, her veganism was to her portfolio and we came to the realization that she was willing to have some trade-offs especially around um, animal testing for pharmaceuticals so obviously that's a, a, a a challenge if you are trying to set up a portfolio um, with with healthcare in the mix or, or pharmaceuticals in the mix, and so by having that discussion with her around you know her own story of becoming vegan and and that journey, we're able to also um, work through you know how how pure does she want her portfolio to align with her values and, and work through those trade offs. So that that's sort of a retail story, a wholesale story was a client that I've been working with now for uh, close to three years. Um, he's, he's, you know, he, he's quite a, uh, a vocal client in the sense that, you know, you, you, if, you, if you have a look around, he's sort of featured in the AFR and a few other uh, publications around the work that he's doing around impact. So he's actually, he came to me about a year or two ago and said, look, Justin, I actually want to, I, I don't want to have any of my wealth left. Um, I want a, a spend down strategy 
for my different buckets of wealth. So when I talk about different buckets, his his non super funds, his superannuation funds, and his philanthropic funds. So he's got a, a fairly decent philanthropic vehicle as well. And so the idea with him was really around you know aligning to his or, or understanding his theory of change. So one of the things that we've been working through with probably more so more our wholesale clients and our retail clients is defining their theory of change. What what how are they enabling change or being catalytic with their capital if that's what they want? And you know, is it both a mixture of their portfolio but also their story? So we're we're working, we're finding more and more clients are uh, you know they they're concerned about climate. It's probably their key concern. And and they're sort of seeing that the window of time we have is 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 shrinking, and so they want to do more. And so we're finding that not only the role of their capital, but their role of their story is is a really powerful lever for change. And so within that wholesale context, um, obviously there's a lot more to choose from, and uh, we can probably get a little bit more creative with how we uh, invest in impact. Um, but yeah, that's probably the two examples that I'll, I think are worthwhile sharing. Karen, um, happy to happy to also talk to any advisors who listen to this um, that want to talk more. Um, happy to share. Yeah, I think it's nice to sort of compare and contrast that investors that are suitable for impact investing can be quite different. So as you say, they can be those that want to really have their capital working in a catalytic way and really a meaningful spend down strategy, as you said, or they can be smaller retail investors that just want to do their bit and know they're not doing any harm. So it can be they can be quite uh, different in terms of their financial means to make impact, but they might still have the same intentions if that if that comes through. What about for you, Tim? Do you have a, sh- a short story you'd like to share? Uh, well, I think in, in line with what Justin mentioned, but so. I don't know if a particular one comes to mind, but several clients with inherited share portfolios, yeah, and the the value of those portfolios will range, obviously. But they're always interesting ones to deal with in the sense that, yeah, they're coming to us because, one, they've received an inheritance that they're not sure what to deal with. And then, two, it might be a case of this, you know, for the most part, it's the miners and the banks that they might not be comfortable with. So then it's having that conversation with them. What are you not comfortable with and what are you wanting to achieve with this? So they're just having that impact um, aspect being able to come into play. It's because it's a gradual journey with the clients, right? Like they they may come in expecting just to wipe the slate clean straight away, but often it's a case of delaying it over a period of time. So it's it's nice kind of going through those journeys with kites where it's you're gradually shifting away from what was you know, six, seven, eight Australian you know, shares across to something more broad and in line with what they're after. So I think they're probably the more enjoyable. Um, well, and they're all enjoyable, but they're probably a couple of the, uh, the examples that come to mind anyway. Yes, I think that's so important. true. I was just going to say, I think that's an important point you mentioned, Tim, in the sense of, uh, transitioning clients because you yeah, know one of the considerations is capital gains as, as I'm sure uh, you know is quite often an issue to, to work so through and it's just be like no I don't care I just want to get rid of it yeah. yeah as an advisor you might have to explain them through all of that but then for the most part they will accept it and then it's yeah just that gradual approach to it so. yeah we've had some clients so where they've had you know a two to five year sell down or cleansing yeah. um, process <laughs> where it, yeah, so we, we, one of our clients actually coined that term and we've been using it more recently around cleansing their portfolio and how long is the cleanse going to take? Um, you know, is it, a, is it a quick cleanse or is it a long, long dated cleanse? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a um, really good point you mentioned there, Tim, around um, you know, that transition from one portfolio to another. Yes, practically we have to do what's right for the client um, and – I'm so grateful that both of you could join us today because I really feel that you've delivered a wealth of insight um, to the advisors listening and they're really going to come away from today really understanding how they can go forward in their practices and really have some great impact investing conversations with their clients. So I'd just like to wrap it up and thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all of your knowledge 
um, all of your actionable tips. Um, and remember that advisors listening, you can make a difference and help your clients align their investments with their values and goals by having these discussions about impact investing. So thank you again to Tim Fitzpatrick and Justin Metcalf. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Tim. 